Well, hello everyone and welcome to our Sunday show. I am here with a glass of wine, yes, on the social patio. Do we have a fun show for you today? I think I, I told you that I kind of felt like the front yard was finished a while ago. Well, the infrastructure was finished, but I sure had a lot of perennials and other kinds of seasonal color that I wanted to plant. I did some shopping, and in this episode, I'm going to show you some of the plants that I picked and introduce another whole area of the garden. I told you about Lemon Lane before. Well, let me introduce you to Autumn's Edge. And mm -hmm. then after we do that, wait till the end because you're going to get the full reveal of what it looks like in its finished, let's just call it finished <laughs> state. A garden is never, never finished. finished yeah. But for right now, other than a few tweaks um, and a few more little details that I want to execute, I would say I'm going to call it done. <laughs> and I am very thrilled with the way it turned out. There's some grass still needs to be filled in and things still need to mature. But Stuart, we definitely need to put up a before picture and an after oh, picture. Yep. In fact, there have been a number of people who have driven by today and commented on that very thing. So if you are new to this channel, welcome. Please subscribe and make sure that you give us a thumbs up. And more importantly, if you think there's somebody out there that might like to keep company with us in this channel, then please make sure to share, send them our link. So Stuart, what do you say? Let's do it. Let's do it. When you are working in the garden, it is helpful to kind of divide your garden into different workspaces so that then you feel as if you can just work that manageable space before moving on to the totality of the whole garden. Well, I do the same thing in mine, and today I am working not in Lemon Lane, but I am working on an area that I have dubbed autumn's edge. Now, why have I done that? Well, it's really not just for affectation. It's because I am thinking that this is the area of the cottage garden that will really shine in autumn, more so maybe than other areas of the garden. And part of that is inspired by a plant that will be absolutely spectacular in the fall, and that is the October Glory Maple that is grounding Autumn's Edge. And then what I did was I came in and I planted with Southern Living Plants my Autumn's Edge infrastructure, and I want to quickly go through those because now that they're in, we're gonna do something fun. We're gonna take a little visit over to Brex Nursery and I'm gonna get some perennials that will also be planted in that same area. But let's look first at the infrastructure, then we'll go buy some plants, then we'll come back and plant them. So here we go. Number one, I've started with the tree, my October glory. Now to me, nothing is more magnificent in the fall than orange rocket barberry. It's absolutely gorgeous. It looks beautiful right now. I mean, look at that foliage. It's kind of coral. It's also kind of a dark maroon color. And then it has a tendency to change in the fall. And all of us gardeners, even though we're in the height of spring right now, we're still thinking about seasons to come because we want to get those fall plants in the ground before the heat so that they can then really get established and look magnificent in the fall. Okay, so that's my number one. That's um, uh, orange rocket barberry. Now, number two is Fire Chief Arborvita. And you can see that even though it's green underneath, when it starts putting out new growth and sometimes as it ages, it literally gets fiery on the edges. So this is Fire Chief Arborvita, and I love the textural contrast between the two in addition to the color echo. Third, I love the abelias, and I think that it is probably one of the most underused categories of plants. Now, in addition to being spectacular in the fall and having good textural interest 
in cohesion with one another. It's also important that they really are tough and can handle this brutal exposure. So look here at this kaleidoscope abelia, another fabulous color echo in this Southern Living Plant Triad. So look at the stems on that. Can you see how it's kind of orange there, you guys? I'm gonna come in closer. I just wanted to show all three of them. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's just beautiful, but look at that, look at that orange stem. And this provides another color echo, particularly as it grows and these stems get longer with the orange rocket and the fire chief. Now, some other shrubs that I think really kind of play um, a secondary role in this montage um, and those are what I think of as really infrastructure, infrastructure plants that hold it all together both in spring and in fall. So over here we have the magnificent tough as nail sunshine lagustrum, which at this time of year is just a brilliant, brilliant limey yellow, but it'll turn a little bit more gold as fall approaches. And then lastly, one of the most stalwart plants that you can have in your garden, and that is Obsession Nandina. It does not bury, but boy, look at that gorgeous foliage that it puts out in that maroon autumnal color. So these are the infrastructure plants that I've got for Autumn's Edge, in addition to a few others that I will show you later when we come back to plant. But Stuart, why don't, you, why don't we just take a break here and let's go get some perennials to kind of fill this space out. Let's do it. Okay, so what's on my list? What am I gonna be on the hunt for for Autumn's Edge? Perennials that will look brilliant in the fall, but will also be gorgeous in the summer. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find these there, but these are some of the things that I've got on my list. I'm looking for Gara that uh, it's got that kind of whirly bird. I can't even remember what the common name is. And that's my question of the day. What's the common name for Gara? I really can't, I can't remember. Uh, but it has that fluttery, hovering, bouncy quality that I like that will also be absolutely fabulous with the rest of the other pollinating plants up here at, at um, up on the upper terrace. The other thing that I'm gonna look for are more penstemons, particularly if they have kind of a maroonish foliage to them. Anything that will enhance the purples, the deep maroons, and really, really communicate fall. I'm going to be looking at some gray foliage plants. I'm not sure what exactly, but I'm going to be on the hunt for them. And then basically, I'm just going to keep my eye open for anything that is is kind of in this palette. I'm also going to be looking for some tall flocks, which will be spectacular in the summer, and sometimes I can get it to rebloom in the fall. Uh, so what do you think, Stuart? Let's just head that way. Okay, you guys, let's do some perennial shopping. I'm here with my buddy, Sean, at Bricks on 40th and Classen. If you guys have followed me for a while, you have been here with me before. So, Sean, today I'm looking for some kind of specific things, but then I'm also gonna keep my mind open because I'm looking for, I'm thinking about the future and about some plants that I wanna get in the ground now, but that will look fabulous, not only in summer, but also in the fall. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to ask you for a couple things. I'm looking for penstemon. Do you think you've got any, or penstemon, however you pronounce yes, it? Yes, we've got the we've got the Husker Red right over here. Okay. Um, and it's in a, it's actually blooming right now in its full glory. Okay, I'm looking for probably some succulents, maybe, and with kind of a reddish cast. Yeah, well, we've got a ton of different succulents. So okay. we've got a big group right here, and then another group on the side okay. of the house. Okay. Um, uh, Gara, do you have any Gara? We are fresh out of Gara. We have probably sold a thousand plants of Gara this oh season. My gosh. I'm serious. I mean, I bought so much Gara and it's all gone. It's uh, all gone. So we are we are in the middle of wrangling some more Gara. Okay. Hopefully within the next week or so. Okay. And the nice thing about working with with small purveyors like Sean is he will let me know when he gets that Gara in, and I can just run down and pick it up. And then I'm also kind of looking for some tall flocks. 
Yes, we've got we've got some tall flocks, uh, some garden flocks. Okay. Um, uh, in a in a pink, I think right over here. Okay. Well, I will take a look at it. Don't mind us. We're just going to look around. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming in. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Stuart, let's do this. So you guys know that I like to mix my edibles with my ornamentals. And on Autumn's Edge, I'm not going to be putting in any basil. But if I did, this would be a wonderful option. This is purple ruffles. You guys are probably familiar with it. Um, I'm actually going to do some basil up front, but it's going to be in a different form. But that is glorious and would really be beautiful as part of my, my color montage that I'm putting together. Um, mm, just love Very it, love smelly. it. I'm going to have to come back later, Stuart, and just get some herbs. Okay, now I'm seeing some sedums here that have a look. This looks like it's two different varieties, but this has that purplish cast to it. Okay, this is Sun Sparkle Dazzleberry Sedum. Oh my gosh, look at that. Hold it steady for a sec. Isn't that gorgeous? That's really it. Wow. That <laughs> is really beautiful. So this is one variety that he's got. And then, what is this? Is this the same thing, or is this different? Okay, this is different. This looks like it's taller, purple emperor sedum. So this is beautiful too, but what is striking my fancy, I think, is this first one, because it will kind of trail. And the thing about, about this kind of sedum is I typically don't get a lot of it because I can just always pinch off sections of it and stick it in the ground. And I can increase my inventory of it that way. I think I'm gonna get maybe a couple of these. I'm gonna make sure I get one that looks really good, happy, and full. Sun Sparkle Cherry Tart. And this is Sun Sparkle Dazzleberry. So let me see. Is there a tag here that shows the difference in the color? Because I wanna get the same ones. Cherry Tart. Look here. This is the color that I want, so I may just have to get one. Let's see what this is. This is cherry tart. Aha! Score! I found two. So on my list is Sun Sparkler Dazzleberry Sedum. So I love that. And while you weren't watching, Stuart, I found a Husker <laughs> Red Penstemon. I might have to get one or two more of those. Now, typically when I buy them, um, I typically buy plants in odd numbers, one, three, or five. One, if it's just kind of a specimen plant. Two, uh, if I want to flank something on either side for symmetry. But for me, most of the time, when I'm planting in dr drifts, I look for odd numbers. So in this case, I'll probably be mostly either getting one, three, or five, depending on how rapidly I think they'll spread and how big they'll get. Okay, now I'm not going to get any coleus today, but this would be absolutely spectacular with the vignette that I'm creating. Oh, that I'm one's just, cool. I mean, aren't these just fabulous? Hold oh, on, that is amazing. Yeah, and th the th thing about this is it would look fabulous in a modern garden. It would be gorgeous in the fall, but also it has kind of a contemporary feel to it with lots of color echoes. And now in the fall, I could come back and incorporate some of this. Linda, Look at this, this little sweet one. This is just one of the coolest one. plants I've seen. I know, it's, it is. But it's very fun, isn't it? There are that one and this one. There are so many different varieties of coleus. This is just insane. And as you guys know, I don't have to tell you, um, it can propagate so, so easily. So I may or may not be getting some coleus, but that's not what I'm focused on today. I'm trying to be... Can I grow that inside? You can grow it, yes you can, in a bright sunny window. You can you can easily propagate it and we, 
We have shown how to do that before. We might need to do it again. Now, I'm not going to get any of this because I already have some. But this is that wonderful Joseph's coat. It can be kind of hard to find, so I want to point this out if you are on the hunt for some. Now here's another plant, again, that I'm not going to get, but I want to point out some gorgeous combinations for you guys. This is an annual. This is a petunia. Uh, what does that say? It says, Sweet Tunia Fiona Flash. Fiona Flash. And that color is absolutely gorgeous. And what a wonderful color echo that would be with the striations and the markings in the center of this petunia with the rest of these plants. I think it would be absolutely gorgeous if you are putting together a container. But again, I need to quit showing plants I'm not gonna plant and maybe show some plants that I am. It's probably helping everybody. Okay, I just can't seem to get away from these beautiful color combinations. Look at that purple. Now this is an annual salvia and I wanna point it out because it can really, really handle the heat. And you could go a couple ways with this. This deep purple would be more of a monochromatic look. But for a fall or a summer combo, that would be gorgeous too. And again, this is really, really tough. If you keep deading, deadheading it, it will bloom all through summer to frost. And that is just an annual salvia. Most of my annuals that I'm planting, for example, this scaviola, I'm planting a little bit closer to the places where I will travel and where I want real punches of color. Here's more coleus. Okay, I'm seeing something. I'm seeing something on my list. Okay, so this is the tall phlox. In contrast to creeping thrift that I had at my other house, that emerald blue that cascaded over the side and bloomed in the spring, this is a tall phlox, super capal fuchsia phlox. Again, this is something that, I, let's see. Well, I get there a little late sometimes. Sorry, okay. <laughs> so this is absolutely gorgeous. And by the way, these are grown locally at, uh, red dirt in Guthrie and this one Greenleaf is also here in Oklahoma and you can already see a hint of the coloring to come. Now a lot of times what I will do is see what color I want and what it's going to turn out to be but that's not necessarily the plant that I buy. Sometimes the best plant to actually get established in your garden will not have any buds on it yet or the buds will be small. What you want to make sure is that they are not too root bound and look like they have been really, really cultivated well. So I think these are going to be just fine and I am going to get three of these. And my goodness, they all look so healthy and none of them look the worse for wear. So I'm just going to get some that I think are really full. I am going to, this one looks like a good candidate, and I think I'm going to get three of these and look at this beautiful combo. Isn't that just beautiful? And you can see how this color palette will just be spectacular. And again, everything that I am selecting is tough, 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 and can really handle that exposure. And will be really gorgeous with all of the Southern Living plants that are already there. Okay, I see something here. I may come back for it, but it would be gorgeous in the garden right now. Look at that purple skull cap. And it looks like, oh, that is really, really gorgeous. Six inches high, 10 inches wide, and it takes full sun. So I think 
I'm just going to keep my eye on it. This would have been brilliant for the window box as a perennial. Uh, so I'm going to just remember this. I'm going to keep this on my list, but we're going to proceed. Now here would be another candidate that I would buy if my friend Gail Wynn had not already gifted me a bunch of it. And I have planted all sorts of starts because starts of asters that you get established now will be really, really wonderful in the fall. They will bloom in late summer. They've got this purpley color, which I think is just brilliant. But then here is something I am not familiar with. So these are just Woods Blue Aster, but something else that might be quite spectacular and something I am not familiar with is Katie Ruella Dwarf Mexican Petunias. Now I am familiar with Mexican Petunias, but not the dwarf variety and for that space only dwarf would do so this and i kind of like this pink the white i would like for a different time of year but again because it's got this gorgeous color palette that matches what i'm going for i think this might be brilliant so this is roelia this is another red dirt plant katie's dwarf pink full to part sun and let's see how big this is going to get because that's a consideration. Plant in sun or part sun, 15 to 18 inches, grows 10 to 15 inches tall. Okay, so I think that is probably a pretty good scale for what I want. I'm gonna get, and because I also believe in trying new things, and they only, looks like, is this pink? Looks like they only have a couple of pink ones. So I'm going to diverge from my normal buying in, in threes to fives, and I'm gonna get a couple of these. My cart's getting full, Stuart. It's a good thing. Okay. Let's see, what have we here? Oh, some pink stoke aster. I'm not gonna get any of these, but these are really, really beautiful. Um, I had some established at my other garden and they did great for years and then they kind of faded away. Now here's something else that I probably need more of, but I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna let this, I've got one or two planted from my friend Gail. I'll wait and let this go to seed. Um, and this is just the standard Magnus Purple Coneflower Echinacea. So that's more of the common variety, but probably my favorite. Well, this is not going in the autumn corner, autumn's edge, but boy, this is a spectacular plant. And I might look at this for the back. This is Sugar Tip Rose of Sharon. And, I, and why it catches my eye, I am not normally a Rose of Sharon kind of gal, but I love the foliage on this. Look, it even comes with its own ladybug, Stuart. Oh, wow, free of charge. Free of charge. It even comes with its own, own aphid eater. Uh, but this one looks really beautiful, and even though it's not in flower, I love that flower form. So I, can you see that? We kind of did. We'll yeah, do. love that. So I am going to put that in the back of my mind, maybe for the backyard. And then there's one other plant over here that I've heard about, Stuart, and we're going to close on this one because uh, I haven't seen it, and it's a southern living plant. Mm. Now, in addition to the perennials and annuals that I've discovered here, they also have some absolutely gorgeous shrubs. They've got fabulous topiary. Um, I kind of have, I'm, I'm putting myself on, on a topiary uh, sabbatical, Stuart. I can't, <laughs> can't have any more right now. But I did want to show you this because this is one southern living plant that I did not get from my front garden and I'm having some regrets. 
and this is stunning. It's the Summertime Blues Chase Tree, but the thing that's brilliant about it is not only is it for full sun, but it is compact. It's five to six feet high and four to five feet wide. And most of them, most chase trees or vitex that we are familiar with are far larger and really are small trees. But look at that wonderful, wonderful color. I just love it. And when it's in bud form, it's equally as beautiful. And the color of the foliage is just beautiful just brilliant. I love it. I may have to find a place somewhere, somewhere for this Vitex. I think this is a new offering. Well, Stuart, I think we're going to end there because we've got some planting to do. So I'm going to settle up with Sean and we're going to head back to the cottage. Okay, so I've got on my favorite Cool Jobs gloves. And now I'm gonna go ahead and get these in the ground because it is perfect perennial planting uh, conditions. It's overcast, it's cool. We might have some rain on the horizon and this is just the kind of weather that these perennials will want to get established. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this one in and then I'm going to show you kind of my design philosophy for placing the other ones before I plant them. So true to form, uh, Sean went the extra mile and he found a couple of gar that he had in the back. I'm still waiting on a third white one. But I will love the way this white fluttery flower will look up here on the terrace, particularly with these blue flowers. And it very much is part of the thematic that I have for this area. Now, when you plant a perennial, this is just kind of basic gardening. Most of you already know that, but in case we have some new followers or a new viewer, please make sure to subscribe, hit that like button, and of course, and most importantly, share with others who might enjoy this content as well. Okay, so there you go for my little commercial. Now, typically I do when I plant a perennial, even though when we amended all of the soil at the top of the terrace, I did incorporate lots of organic matter. I'm nevertheless going to put another uh, handful of this Espoma Biotone Starter Plus in here, and I'm going to mix it up in the hole so the plant doesn't sit directly on top of, on top of the fertilizer in case of root burn. Now sometimes I'll use Osmocote or a slow release fertilizer, but what I've done is dig a hole that is two times the diameter, the width of this pot, and then I'm going to plant it so that the top of the pot is level with the top of the hole. And today, as I've said before, the, the soil might be just a little bit too wet to plant. Um, ideally, it wouldn't be quite so gummy. Um, but this is one of those occasions where I'm just going to work with what I've got. And I'm just going to come back in here and backfill this with this yummy soil. This good, rich, dark soil. Now, I'm not putting any more compost in here because this soil has already been amended and I'm going to apply some gentle pressure to that and in this case I am going to keep the plant tag in here for a little while this is Beletza white and I'm going to put that down into the hole so you really can't see it but I will know it's there and then Stuart, while I'm doing this, if you would kind of show kind of at eye level, you can see how the colors of these are starting to merge together. And how this montage is going to express itself in the summer and in the spring. So where I have placed the others, 
I won't make you guys stay around to plant them all with me, but I've got another white Degara that I'll be placing there. And then the other ones I really just wanted to be in drifts. So if you notice, as we progress from west to east towards autumn's edge, the foliage starts becoming darker and richer and more purpley or kind of a cardinal color. I.e. the colors of fall. So in here, I have placed some of the tall flocks and I've got them in a drift. I've got, I should get out of the way, I guess. I've got one there, one there, and one there. So this is going to be kind of a drift that you will see moving from west to east, kind of cascading down. And of course, I always can relocate them slightly a little bit later if, if I so choose. But hopefully they'll be where they are and they can get established and then I can just divide them later. I've put some more of the pinstemon. This is Husker Red. The other variety that I had was, it was Dakota Burgundy Beard Tongue, which is also the common name for it. And it has more lavender flowers. So I think the two tones of the foliage is beautiful, but again, all in the same tonal range with wonderful color echoes. So I've got a drift here. One, I actually, I just got two of these because I already had three of the other pen stem, and so that keeps me in my odd numbered flow. So I've got one, two, three, four, and there's another one over there. So that makes five. And then I've got, because I always think you should try something new, I've got my Ruella right here. And I think it will, I, I'll just plant it rather closely together so that it looks like one large tuft, since I typically don't plant in twos, but I'll plant it close together. So I have a large strappy kind of mound in here, and I think it'll be beautiful. And then lastly, you guys might want to know, and some of you earlier uh, in the design wanted to know if I was going to have any sedums. And indeed I will. And it is going to be on the side underneath the maple, kind of cascading down the edge. So I've got a gallon here and I'll probably place another gallon in here somewhere. I'm not 100% sure on that because I want to make sure that it doesn't uh, get in the way, get shaded out too much or covered up by the roses and the ester that I have planted. That I will talk a little bit more when I give about a little bit more when I give you the entire finished product. Now I've got another kaleidoscope abelia that I found that had kind of been hidden in the back, and I think I'm going to plant another one here to harmonize with the existing ones and with the barberry. So I think it's going to be beautiful when it all comes together. Stuart, what you say, we maybe go down on the sidewalk and give a view of what it will look like from sidewalk level when you look across the surface of the upper terrace. But I think it should be really, really beautiful. I'm going to enjoy it this summer. I won't be able to wait until fall, but now is the time to get them in the ground. So as you're doing your perennial buying, when you're on your perennial shopping spree this year, remember that you want to think about not only what the garden looks like now and in the summer, but what it will look like in the future, in the fall and in coming years. Okay, Stuart, right here is where we need to do the big reveal. First, let's put up what it looked like before we moved in, when the landscape was barren of nothing but grass and there was no landscaping in place, no trees, no color, no shrubbery. It was pretty much a blank slate. What I wanted when I moved from the other house to this sweet little cottage. And I think it's pretty transformed. So I want to review a little bit about what we did 
in the evolution of this whole space, we had to re-concrete the walkway. We then had to float out the steps and the porch to make sure that it was all harmonious. We put in lots of brickwork. We made a grid on the upper terrace to delineate between the perennials and all of the let's call it cottage garden, cottage garden elements on the upper terrace as distinguished from the rolling terrace, which is nothing but grass. Now this side here, I'm gonna concentrate on the grass for a minute because I'm kind of proud of it, even though it hasn't filled in completely. You may recall that I had this kind of existential thing about the grass here to keep it, to let it go, should it, you know, should it exist, should I completely remove it and put in new sod? And I decided on the former. So what I did was kill out any kind of weeds that were here. I literally, with a dandelion digger, I dug up lots of the weeds. I then came back in and we top dressed it with some really good rich mix. I didn't even have to overseed. But what I did do was take little pieces of sod from the east side along the flagstone patio going to the back. I stole a little bit from Peter to pay Paul Yay. and I patched a couple of areas. There's still some crabgrass that I need to remove and it needs to fill in. But look at all of these wonderful runners that are starting to take hold along the edge. Now I know that for a lot of you, Bermuda grass is not a boon, it's a bane. But I promise you in Oklahoma, it is tough and it's the toughest kind of, of grass that I could have here on this facade which is in the strongest heat, sun, brightness. It's on a slope so water, water drains off so I really needed it to be extremely, extremely tough and I think it's going to be just fine. Now Stuart if you would because I'm equally as proud of this area here between the sidewalk and the street. You may recall that there was hardly any turf here at all. There were no trees. We installed the trees and I think they look beautiful. Am I anxious? Am I anxious to get these posts off? Well, that is an understatement. I very <laughs> much am, but I'm also trying to be very diligent. I think one of the best comments you guys have ever given me, I've taken so much advice from you, and that was when someone suggested that I paint these in black or in a dark color so they would recede. And that was just brilliant, brilliant advice. I did that on this side, I did it on that side. And you can see that with the exception of a couple of areas, this turf has filled in beautifully. It looks the best probably right And here. all, uh, certainly all of this rain helped. Now this is an area that once it starts getting very hot and very dry, this space is not irrigated. So in short order, probably, I would say in July, this will probably, if we don't have sufficient rainfall, this will start to kind of turn a little bit brown. And I'm okay with that because that's just the nature of an Oklahoma summer. But I will make sure that I continue to water the trees. Now, this leads me to, I know I probably asked a question of the day in the previous segment, but Stuart, let's do another reveal of the entire landscape because here's my big question of the day. What do you think? Did you have faith in me that I could maybe produce something here in relatively short order? We didn't move in until December, so let's do a countdown, Stuart. That's December, January, February, March, April, and part of May. So that is how long it took to create this, certainly with the help of Encore Azalea and the Southern Living Plant Collection and lots of my friends and even followers who donated some plants for the upper terrace. So I'm really loving the way it looks. And now let me introduce you to some of the new players in the landscape. So when I was showing you that marvelous 
fun, very fun reel mower. A lot of you keen-eyed viewers noticed some new residents of the cottage on the hill. For First and foremost, probably the apple blossom drift or, or um, kind of cascading roses, ground cover roses that I alluded to. I'm going to love these when they put on buds. And when I planted them, they had no buds at all. And look, Ooh. they are already starting to put on some tiny buds. And before too long, these will be profuse in bloom and I think will be spectacular framing not only the entryway up to the porch, but also framing the edges of the property on the east side and a little bit on the west side. So I think it'll be, I think it will be really spectacular. As a reminder, these are in the pale pink and white, which will then harmonize beautifully, I think, with the purples and the whites and the blues and will very much be that English color palette that I like. Now, this is something that some of you commented on, and quite frankly, it was a decision made after I, after I did some soul searching, checked my budget, looked a hundred times at the landscape, and decided if it was an investment I needed to make. And I'm sure you guys do the same thing. And I decided that for this property in the front to kind of feel finished to me it wasn't going to feel finished until i had a really strong supportive grounding element here on the west side consequently i decided to come in with another really large nelly stevens hollies now we planted this about two weeks ago which is a little bit later than i normally like to install what i call investment plants of this magnitude but i'm so glad i did because subsequently we got really really great rain and i think it's going to settle in just fine so that's a tip if you're looking at installing something a little bit later in the spring than you normally would like, just continually look at the 10-day forecast and see if it's going to be a rainy stretch of time so that whatever you put into place can get acclimated. And I'm just thrilled that it is getting acclimated and seems, seems happy there. You may also notice that the urns are starting to fill out. And now that we've finally gotten some sun, I think all of this color is just gonna be profuse and is just gonna be kind of like fountains of color out of these urns. I think it will be pretty spectacular. Some of you pointed out, and I agree, that the scale of these on top should be a little bit larger than the scale of those on the bottom. And what I'm going to do, since the pots, the urns are all of the same size, what I'm going to do is just let this profile of the plants in them get a lot larger than the profile of the plants in the bottom. Stuart, does that make sense? Yeah, and I got a great shot of it. <laughs> okay, so uh, great. So these are going to get really, really large and I'll keep those a little bit smaller so that the scale will seem to make sense. You may have also noticed that in addition to the drift roses, I decided to plant another couple of anchoring boxwoods. And I'm thrilled that I did because I love the way there is now this, well, it's not a, it's not a heart. I'm not sure what this shape is, half of an egg shape, but I love the way it frames the portal up to the front porch. And I think that's really, really beautiful. Now let's talk about what probably is, is, I think, one of the best deals ever. And it was on Amazon, but it's a, it's a secondary company that sells through Amazon, so I'm happy to support them. I apologize. I think, I, I think because so many of you guys recognized it to be such a great deal, that you decided to hop on the deal just like I did and we drove up the price. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that because when I first purchased these Cranberry Creek boxwood, they're three gallons and look, Stuart, 
I didn't have to pay extra. Well, I don't know if you can see it, but I have noticed so many. Oh, there's the ladybug right there. Oh, it'll be gone by the time. It'll I get be up gone there. by the time you get up there. I didn't pay extra for the ladybug, but I I can't tell you what a great deal these were. When I first ordered them, I think they were forty-three or forty-four dollars, and now they have gone up to fifty-nine. They were out of stock for a while. Now they've gone up to fifty-nine. But can I just say that even at fifty-nine, and if you still haven't ordered any, definitely I will put a link in the description box below, because so many of you took advantage of this deal. And there are so many of you bought them and then sent me a private message saying how spectacular the quality of them was. So I encourage you, even at the price point of $59, you can wait to see if it goes back down, but I doubt, doubt that it will. Not after this. <laughs> Not after this. But I promise you, this is still a great deal. And I am. this is not a sponsored post. This is just a great deal i just happened to come across and i want you guys to experience it like i did because actually actually not only did i drive up the price for you but i drove up the price yeah, for myself as well true. i had to pay more too when i ordered two more <laughs> so i think it's it's such a great deal there's also these are cranberry creek but there's also a green mountain boxwood and i'm sorry for spending so much time on this but I promise you, this is one of the best deals I've ever seen online. They come and they are so healthy. They might be a little droopy because they're in shock from changing locations, but they're a great deal. So I digress, but I planted two of them here at the top of the steps. And then later, I planted two more of them here. So now I have four conical boxwoods that are residing in the middle of my little boxwood villages. And I think they look wonderful. They look statuesque and they will be prominent and have the visual weight that I want while the better boxwood that's blight resistant along the perimeter of them grows up and takes hold. So I'm very, very excited about that. Yeah, that will look good. I think it, it will look marvelous. And then I might, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm still deciding on how detailed I want to clip my boxwood if I want to leave it kind of flouncy or if I want to give it a really tight profile. I'm thinking about that for the boxwood and a lot of other things that are in the landscape, including the Eugenia. So now let's talk about them. Now, these are what I think of as boxwood doppelgangers. They're not frost hardy. I bought these years and years ago. Stuart, I don't even remember. Where did I get these? Uh, Was it like at Home Depot or I'm sure Walmart? sure I've heard you say it before, but I don't remember. <laughs> but I don't even remember. But I have had these for I don't know how long. And what I did was I just buried the pot in the ground so that when the first frost approaches, all I have to do is lift that pot out of the ground and put them in the greenhouse where they will live over the course of the winter. And then all I have to do is just put them back into place next year because I very, very strategically prepositioned where I wanted these to be. So this is Eugenia number one. This is Eugenia number two. Isn't that the name of, of one of the, the royals, Eugenia? Um, and then I actually have a place over here. And this is gonna be a surprise because I'm gonna kind of show you how I decide to do it. But I now have in place, because I always like to do things in threes. I've got one, two, three. This will be where the third Eugenia resides. Once I do some pruning and clipping on it, and Stuart and I are gonna do a video for that. Now, they are doing what I really wanted to do, which was provide some intimacy for the social patio. And I think it's done it really pretty well, don't you, Stuart? I do. And it provides some visual height. Now, the other thing that you guys have probably noticed is that in my imaginings, 
my vision of what I wanted this to be, I saw in my head, I saw an umbrella. And originally I had wanted it to be white, but then I saw this one that was in kind of a buff color and I'll put the links in the description box below because it so beautifully echoes the color of the path and I love, love the way it does that. I decided to get a crank, a crank operated umbrella because it's just so much easier. Is that faux wood or real wood? This oh. is a faux wood. It looks pretty real. It's actually metal, Probably but better. I love the way it looks. <laughs> and here's the deal, because so many of you said it's gonna be way too windy up here. Well, the thing is, every night or every morning, whenever it's windy, all I do is just roll it down so that it's not up to catch the catch the breeze and sail across the neighborhood. It's going to go to Kansas at some point. And if it's really, really windy, all I have to do is take it out. Now, interestingly, and here's another tip, interestingly, the expense of this composition was not the umbrella itself. The expense was in oh, wow. the base. The base was pretty expensive and it's on wheels that I can lock. It's very heavy, but I can then wheel it from one side of the social patio to the other side of the social patio, depending on where I want the shade. And I think it's brilliant. I also loved it because look, it harmonizes the texture of it and the profile of it and the finish of it harmonizes with my little storage container that's a side oh, table snap. over here, which I think I have shared with you. Well, it's almost is like where the same I thing. keep, yeah, is where I keep all of all of my just gardening accoutrement. So I've got that in there. My clippers, my scissors, my cool jobs garden gloves. I keep those in there for quick access. And then of course I added I added the table. The window box is just coming along beautifully. And I'm just so proud of it. Let me show you how it's grown up. So a lot of you thought it started out kind of gangly and I've showed you this before, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but I have brand new baby asparagus fern tendrils or branches or fronds, whatever they're called, that's starting to project from the base where I cut it back hard. It's We're right there, way. Stuart. I don't know if you can see oh, it we're find right out. there. It almost looks like it's dead but that is brand new. So it will fill in this void. And then in the meantime, I also added a little baby sage that a new friend of mine who, who is just a viewer, Carolina Elizabeth or Carolina Elizabeth, please let me know your name. She came by when I wasn't here the other day and I don't know why you guys are so good to me, but she left, I don't know how many plants for me, how many starts for the garden, and I so, so appreciate it. But this is really starting to fill out. I am feeding it pretty heavily um, because I want lots of color there. And it strikes me how much more color I have in my front yard at this time of year now than I did at my other house at this time of year, because that was more about just structure and form. Oh, it was greener there, huh? It was, yeah, it was yeah. greener there and it was just more filled that. in. And a lot of the evergreen structure and the bones of the garden were already mature and already larger. So I have added not a lot, but a few garden ornaments. So let me show you this first. You might recognize these from the backyard at the fairy tale house. These are just wrought iron or metal um, surrounds. I don't know what else to call them that I had at the other house. And I love the way they look here. They're heavy metal. I got them from Gardener Supply. I don't even know if they're still available, but they were one of the two things that I wanted to frame the porch and frame the entryway. And then I do know for certain that these two boxwood I will keep very tightly clipped 
because I want them to match the profile of these beautiful surrounds and I think that'll be beautiful. And then the other thing I did, we can maybe capture it from a distance, is I put that tutor in that pot that was in my Linda Vodder QVC collection. I put it in that pot and I love the way that the scented geranium from my friend Monica will climb up it. And then I planted some thyme and some calibricoa, some purple calibricoa at the base that will spill out. Um, Stuart, what have I forgotten? I planted a lot more salvia. I planted a lot more penstemon and things that I got on our most recent visit to Brex. Um, I have planted a lot more foxglove seedlings. You can see I've got some plastic pots that are just now sitting in the landscape waiting for me to plant them. And I pan. am just ready for them to get in the ground and, and I'm ready for a lot of the little seedlings that I've planted. Remember, I seeded some Cleome, um, some Celosia, some Verbena bonariensis, and I am ready for a, a lot of that to germinate. And at that point then, I'll just be editing out too much, some Minoan lace. I don't want it to get too thick. I just want it to look like a beautiful, cottage garden at the cottage garden on the hill good segue if good segue <laughs> and and one more thing my friend klaus dalby has a new book coming out on cottage gardens very very timely i wrote the foreword for that book i'm so honored to call him a friend and we will put the link in the description box below stuart's put together a brilliant video to describe how you can find the links and the description box. So Stuart, have we forgotten anything? Surely, but it's okay. I'm sure I have. <laughs> I might be a little tipsy because I'm finally enjoying a glass of wine in my beautiful garden. Thank you so much for strolling along with me and you guys have a wonderful Sunday evening.